<laughs> Going live. Hi. <laughs> How are you guys? Happy. It's Tuesday. <laughs> I almost said happy Monday. Um, happy Tuesday. I'm, I'm sure that's happening to so many of you as well, where you're completely losing track of days. All of my days seem to be um, same shit, different day. <laughs> um, hi. So I know that you guys are going to start asking some questions. Um, and I've got 48 of them that I've saved on my phone. So I've got those there. Um, one of the reasons why we're doing this live today on my YouTube is that normally on Tuesdays at 12 o'clock, we release a YouTube video. Um, we're actually going to try and do that this weekend instead, because with the fitness videos, um, we've been releasing them Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. And what's happening is that our other video that we release on Tuesdays at noon is getting lost in those fitness videos. So we're going to try and find a different day um, for the fit, the uh, regular videos. Um, our next video that's coming out is really fun. It's, um, it's all coffee, isn't it? All coffee. All coffee all the time. <laughs> so our next video um, that's coming out I think we're gonna try it this weekend. I'll make sure to let you guys know when it comes out, but it's, um, I learned how to make the perfect latte, which is actually really fun for me. And I've always wanted to learn how to do this. And so many of you assume that I know how to do this because I played Starbucks. I don't know why, but everybody just assumes that I know how to make really great coffee. Um, so that's a really fun episode and, um, I'm really excited for you guys to see it. And we wanted as many people to see it as possible. So we're trying to find a different day to uh, drop those videos because we wanna keep the fitness videos coming Monday, Wednesday, Fridays. Um, that being said, people are starting to arrive, which is awesome. Welcome, thank you so much for coming. Um, first of all, thank you so much for the birthday wishes and for the, um, the, the what? Engage, the, <laughs> what? The what? <laughs> Robin's like the what? The what? <laughs> For um, the uh, engagement, well wishes, the congratulations, all of them, all of it, all of those things. Um, Robin was really cute, and he like a child, <laughs> but like a very creative child, created this like birthday wall for me that says happy birthday, and he stayed up. So cute. I stayed up, it was like drawing and like had magic markers. It took way longer than it should have for an adult 30 year old man to do that. <laughs> yes, you heard right. He's 30. <laughs> I'm officially a cougar. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but in such a good way. Listen, the men my age just can't keep up with me. It's true. It's true. I've got too much energy. Um, so everyone's arriving. I'm just gonna, um, while you all sort of show up, I'm just gonna answer some questions and we'll just get into that. You guys had so many great questions that came in and I pulled some from Facebook and I pulled some from Twitter and I pulled some from um, from Instagram. So I'm just gonna get through so many of these questions and then I'm gonna take some questions here as well. So thank you guys so much for showing up. I really appreciate this. Um, okay. So this one is from Robert Roberts, and he asked, as an avid Spartan racer, I love your prep and race videos. So if you guys haven't seen that race video, um, look up on my videos on YouTube and go watch the Spartan training um, work, um, episode, and then the I actually ran the Spartan race. Um, and he's asking, will I do another one, perhaps a super? Um, thank you, Robert. So you guys, I loved doing the Spartan race. One of the reasons I did the Spartan race was that Robin actually had done one and he loved it. And I'd always seen them. Um, if you don't know what they are, they're like those obstacle course races. It's like, um, it's like half, like, like seems like half, like, you know, military obstacle course and half like, you know, triathlon, like they're really cool. Um, if you don't know what they are, you can, you can look up Spartan races, but they're really fun. 
I was so intimidated to do one of those things. You know, when I was younger, I was so competitive and like to triathlons and all those things. And um, as I got older, I have this really bad habit, so to speak. Um, I don't like to not win. Um, I know that sounds really crazy, but so much of my motivation to succeed in life was being competitive with my brother and wanting to win. And um, so that is a fantastic motivator, but on one hand, but on the other hand, what it's done is it's actually potentially held me back from doing things in life because I was scared that I wouldn't win, which is a really awful reason to not do something. Um, and so I set out to train as hard as I could for this Spartan race, knowing that um, I would be competing against professional athletes that that are just in phenomenal shape. And, um, and um, so, so that was one of the reasons why I did it was it was... It was more um, about my psychological readiness than it was about my physical body because I wanted to know what it was like to train for something and give something everything I had knowing that I wouldn't win. Um, and not not to not try. Of course I was going to try and I worked as hard as I could. <laughs> um, but it, it, it that was something really psychologically interesting for me to sort of do. So of course I will do another Spartan race. I absolutely want to do one. As soon as it is safe to do one, I will do one. I was supposed to actually compete on my birthday weekend. Um, and obviously that didn't happen um, because of uh, COVID. So as soon as it is safe to do another Spartan race, I will do one. I have actually toyed with the idea of doing a fan team. So let me know what you guys think about that. Cause I think that would be really cool to do like a fan team Spartan race. And maybe we can do it for charity or something. I don't know. I'm throwing it out there. Haven't really thought too much about it. You guys, I'm going to need some help with that one. So um, I will take um, a question from here. Um, um, there's so much. Um, so here's someone, Sarah Spence. Um, hi, Sarah, saying that you make me want to try to be fitter. Um, I'm not good at actually keeping trying, but you make me think that I could. Um, <laughs> fitness is such an interesting thing, right? It's, it's you know, I have had this um, roller coaster of fitness my entire life. I've always been active, um, but I, I am actually more fit now that I'm older than I was when I'm, I was younger. And the reason being is that I think that I have more patience with fitness now and I'm kinder to myself now. That was one of the questions that came in as well, um, that now that I'm 40, um, has anything changed with my fitness? And I think one of the main things that have that has actually changed is that I'm kinder to myself now, um, which in turn has actually allowed me to work harder because um, my expectation now for myself with fitness is just to be the best that I can be. Whereas when I was younger, I was so competitive. Um, and I think as women, so many times we're, we're competitive against each other in a very unhealthy way. Um, I think that we're trained from a very young age as little girls to compete for boys' attention. Um, and so I think we start from a young age having this very competitive thing with other women. And um, uh, so I think that my fitness journey has changed and I've gotten more, more gentle with myself because now I've gotten to a point where I realize that I don't need to compete against other women, that we should all support each other and hold each other up. And there's enough men in the world for all of us. We don't need to hate on each other. <laughs> so, um, and now I'm taken, so you can have them all. <laughs> so, um, so, so I think that with fitness, you, you just have to be kind with yourself and realize that you're going to have bad days and you're going to have good days and you're going to have days that you don't want to work out and it's okay. Sometimes um, you're actually better off to not work out. Um, so you really just have to listen to yourself and and um, and take baby steps. And if you want to get on a fitness journey and you haven't started that yet, just start with something really easy. Um, I know we're all stuck inside right now. Um, and I know that some cities are allowing you to go outside and, and actually go for walks or go for runs or, you know, um, as long as you're still social distancing, 
try that. That's a great thing. But also just if, if you really need to start slow, start slow. Um, do a couple stand-ups in your chair um, throughout the day. Maybe go up and down the stairs um, in your house a couple times. Maybe um, get on the ground and practice, you know, for my mom who's 73 when she hurt her elbow. One of the most important things for my mom to do is practice getting up off the floor. You know, that that might be where your fitness journey is starting. And if that's the case, start there. Practice that a couple times a day and, and just build on top of where you are now and don't try to compete with the person next to you. Just work with yourself. Um, okay. Grace says you are not 40. The fuck you look 25. Oh, thank God. I wish I could say it's a filter on this, but it's just a pretty light. I promise I'm 40. And um, I don't know about you ladies out there, but um, this hair is my natural hair color. Um, and it's starting to, I actually sprayed some um, dry blonde shampoo in it today because it's actually getting darker from being inside so much. So my natural hair color, I mean, this, I guess technically this is it minus a little bit of spray, but so my natural hair color is like this, like a uh, dirty dishwater blonde color. And it gets darker if I don't get sun. So I'm actually thinking about doing this like technique that my hairdresser showed me. If I can go find bleach, like hair bleach, because I now hear that people are now hoarding hair color instead of toilet paper. I think they've realized that the toilet paper thing was like blown out of proportion. No, duh. Um, and now they're hoarding hair dye. So um, I'm going to try this crazy technique that he showed me that you you turn the bleach into like a paste like a toothpaste and you brush it through just the front of your hair and you leave it on for like 15 minutes and then just like brush it out so i may actually try to put some sun streaks in my hair because it's it's getting a little dark for my taste <laughs> um <laughs> so okay so i will ask another question i will just scan through this and pick one here's one okay uh, this is from HRH Tonere. Sorry, I don't know where that's from. But um, what are some things that you learned while working on BSG that has helped you the most as an actor? Um, what were my favorite Starbucks Hilo scenes? Maybe talk about what made that friendship special. Okay, so what are my what are some things that I learned while working on BSG that helped me as an actor? Um, I talked about this. Um, once before, I think it came out in an Entertainment Weekly article um, when we did that reunion with the whole cast. And um, I talked about how, you know, I started acting when I was 14. So I, and I never had studied. Um, I would just go into the bathroom at my house and I would memorize movie scenes and I would go and I would stare in the mirror and I would act with the mirror. Um, I now, someone, I've heard someone say that's actually the worst thing that you can do is like try to act in a mirror. But I was a kid and I wanted to see if my face could do what other people's faces did that I saw on TV. So I started faking um, the emotions, right? And, you know, I built a career from 14 to 21 really just sort of faking those emotions because that's how I taught myself how to act. And um, Eddie almost basically pulled me aside. Um, I was probably 22 at the time. It was, it was during season one of Battlestar. And he pulled me aside and he said, you know, if you would take it a little bit more seriously and stop pretending um, and really focused and, and actually were present, um, you could be really good at this. And I was like slightly offended. I was like, I've been doing this for 10 years, blah, 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 blah. Um, but on the next take, I really listened to him and I took what he said to heart. And um, in that moment was the moment where Starbuck tells Adama that she was responsible for Zach's death. And there was this moment, if you go back and watch that episode, I think it's like episode four of season one. If you go back and watch it, when I leave the room, I cover my head on the way out. Um, and I did that because as Katie, I was so in the moment as Starbuck that it physically made me ill and made me hurt so much that my I felt her pain in every fiber of my being and I had to like cover myself because I was so 
overcome with emotion. Um, and so Eddie helped me, you know, learn how to act basically 10 years after I started. So it was a good moment. Um, so here's another question. Um, this is a question from J O H underscore yo. Um, how did you teach yourself to do a pull up, help a girl out? Um, okay. Pull ups are really hard for women. Um, pull ups are hard for me. Pull ups are hard for so many people. The reason pull ups are hard and Robin, correct me if I'm wrong, is that women carry their weight in their lower half of their body and their arms are not strong enough to lift that much weight. Basically, that's a nice way of saying I got skinny arms and an ass. So it's hard to lift that for women. Um, you can train to do that though. So one of the things that I did to train that was we actually got a one of those inexpensive pull-up bars at home. Um, and I did this specifically for the Spartan race because you have to be able to do a pull-up on the Spartan race. It's one of the things. Um, and um, so I started doing, um, what are those called, baby, when I you drop yourself slowly? Uh, a negative. A negative um, pull-up. So I would jump up on the bar and I would hold it as long as I could. Oh, sorry, this way. And I would lower myself as slow as I could. And then I would do that again. Then I would jump back up and I would lower myself down, focusing on not squeezing my arms, but squeezing my back and really holding, pulling that back down in between your shoulder blades. Um, and that's sort of how I taught myself how to do a pull-up. That being said, girl, I can only do like three pull-ups. And that was on a good day. I haven't done a pull-up for so long that I bet you if I tried it right now, I would not be able to do it. <laughs> so I feel like pull-ups and ladies are a lifetime struggle. Although there are some girls, you go look at some of those, those women that do Spartan races, or if you go on YouTube and you look at some of these like fitness women that, that like, you know, are doing these videos, these girls do so many pull-ups. It's crazy. Um, I've never been one of those women. So um, next question, Ryan Ritchie, 78. Would you rather fight 25 rabbit sized Trisha Helfers or one Trisha Helfer sized rabbit? <laughs> um, that's, a, that's a really good question, but like Trisha and rabbits are biters. So like <laughs> Trisha, when Trisha drinks, she likes to give little love nibbles and like, so like she and rabbits bite. Um, the first so, time I met her, she bit me. She, it's true. She did bite you. Um, would you rather fight 25 rabbit sized Trisha's I, or one Trisha sized rabbit? A so giant rabbit or really small Trisha's? Um, I would rather fight a giant rabbit 100%. than 25 small Trisha's. 25 small Trisha's would scare the shit out of me. I mean, like that would be horrible. Um, 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 the emotion you portrayed as Vic uh, when she cried on Walt's lap. That was amazing. Christina, Giovanna, Maria, Rosa. That, those are a lot of names. Um, I'm glad I got it out in time and it slowed down. Um, thank you for that. So what Christina is referring to, if you guys haven't watched Longmire, you should. Um, if you're looking for something to binge, I would suggest that show. Um, there is a scene in the last season of Longmire um, that she's referring to, and I won't spoil it, but um, it was a really, really emotional scene um, where my character, Victoria, breaks down and we finally see this woman who is who is for seemingly stayed so strong um, for so many seasons. We see her crack and... Um, we what what's so beautiful about that moment for me was to see this woman who's been so strong and the trust that she has in Walt to show him that side of her. Um, she loves him so much and trusts him so much that she finally breaks and 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 I loved that. I thought that was really beautiful. Um, so next question, Wyatt underscore Herb. Um, oh, that's funny. Um, which of your dogs most closely resembles your personality and why? Um, Robin is bringing over the one that does. Hi, this is Nellie. She's mad because you woke her up. Um, and she's chubby. And she snores. And she farts a lot. <laughs> and she's old. Hi. 
And she's deaf. She's so cute, though. You like all the ducks. She's so cute, you guys. This is Nelly. Oh, that's happy. That's happy. And happy is like, happy is my feistiest. He gets so feisty. He's the actual, he's the one that would bite you. So if you ever see us, don't reach down and touch happy. Happy will bite your face off. So we're working on it. Um, but like, he's so fluffy and cute that everyone wants to touch him. And he's actually really good with children though. He just doesn't like adults. Um, so here's Nellie. And she's got physical therapy today. So we're actually going to physical therapy later. Um, I mentioned this um, on my Twitter or Instagram that um, that uh, veterinary services in Canada are considered essential. And so she gets to go to physical therapy still. And she, um, cause she has a torn ACL. Yeah. Um, and so she goes, oh, Vargas is jealous. And then there's my chihuahua. Hi. That's a total asshole. But he doesn't bite. He just pretends like he does. Um, hi. No, don't lick. No. We're asking questions. Okay. Um, okay. Next question. Um, from Nad Beasy. Was there ever a point where you got tired of people calling you Starbuck and all the Battlestar references and jokes um, you have, have you accepted it as a part of your life forever? Um, so here's the funny thing about that is that when I, um, Vargas got gross on me. You guys, I think that's his pee. Man. Got all dressed up and cute and stuff. And then I get like boy gunk on me. Darn it. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, Oh, so Battle no, yeah, Battlestar. Um, when I first finished Battlestar, I wanted to get away from it. You know, it had been part of my life for so long, um, eight years, and I really just wanted to like have a break from that. And so for I'd say for about six months, I didn't want to talk about Battlestar at all. Um, as soon as I got like my next job, so as soon as I landed on 24, actually, um, I love talking about it. And I think part of that was because I got another job. You know, I think I was so fearful that I would never work again. As an actor, I'm always scared that the job that I have is gonna be my last job. And so I think that once I had that sort of like relaxing moment of realizing that like I would keep working, um, I loved talking about it. Um, and I, I love everything about um, Battlestar. I love the people that I met during Battlestar. I love, the 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 acting class that I had consistently from Eddie and Mary I loved that I loved um, the crew and I loved shooting up in Vancouver and I loved all of that stuff about Battlestar and and I think that playing Starbuck I would be remiss to to not recognize that that gave me the career that I have so for me to not be okay with that would be really shitty. Um, um, you know, it's, it's hard because I worked for 10 years before Battlestar and I had a career before Battlestar. But before that, if you go back and you look at my early stuff, I played very stereotypical blonde characters. Um, I think people saw this like bubbly little blonde girl. Um, and they just went, Oh, you can play the ditzy blonde girl. Oh, you can play the stupid girl. Oh, you can play the girl. That's this or that, or all these other things. And, and I didn't want to play those characters forever. And my mom said this thing to me. Um, she said, when your face falls and your tit sag, you're going to need to have a job. <laughs> so, so that was my mother's way of saying, like, um, maybe you should try to diversify your career a little bit there, sweetheart. So um, so I really, really fought for, for Starbucks because I saw it um, changing my, my life and my career, uh, the trajectory of it. So, um, Better yeah, for you. Shelly H, what was one of the biggest things you learned from working with Mary McDonald? Um, I learned so much from working with Mary McDonald. Um, one of the biggest things that I learned from Mary actually was not on camera. It was off camera. I saw Mary McDonald raising two of the most well-balanced, intelligent, um, creative children 
while working. She took time off to have those children and then got, and, and whether or not that was a forced hiatus or whether it was a chosen hiatus, I'm not sure, but she took that time. And when her son, Michael, who's now like 28 was like 12, we were on Battlestar. Um, and, um, it was a really important thing for me to see that women can not, I'm not going to say have it all, because I think that that is a misnomer that we, that, that everybody's all is different. So how do you know if you have it all? But for Mary, she was living her dream, having her career and having a family at the same time. And that to me was beautiful. Um, and so that, that was really important for me to see. Um, how did you meet Robin and how did he propose? Congrats, by the way, Tamara. Um, so Robin and I met at work um, two years ago. Um, and um, well, I'm, I won't tell you all of how he proposed, but um, I mean, you saw it on an ice cream cake, which is my favorite thing in the entire world, you guys. I am obsessed with ice cream cakes. I think they're amazing. I always wanted ice cream cake when I was a kid and I never got them because we didn't have a lot of money and my mom didn't know how to make ice cream cakes. And so um, I never got one. Um, and as an adult, it's the only kind of cake I eat. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so thank you. Um, someone says, you really seem to embrace science fiction, Katie. What do you like most about working in the genre? That's from Supreme um, Heretic. Um, okay, so my dad raised me on science fiction. Um, I watched amazing movies with my dad when I was a kid. Forbidden Planet, um, we watched Abyss, we watched Alien, we watched Predator, we watched... Um, 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 lost in space. We lo we watched my dad and I watched tons of science fiction growing up. It was one of the things that we shared. Um, and so when I started acting, and I actually got to a point in my career where I could sort of pick the direction in which to go, um, I started picking things that my dad would like to watch. Um, and I don't know if I did that purposefully or if I did that, um, is like, a in honor of him or like on accident, I mean, but like, um, I think I also just pick the things that I would want to watch. Um, and so I love sci-fi. Um, so that's why I've embraced the character. And we can't deny that when I first started acting in 1994, that the strong female characters that were well-rounded and multidimensional and, and had all these layers, they were all in science fiction. Um, and so that's sort of how I ended up in sci-fi is that I would've been drawn towards those characters. Um, um, Carol says, is there any one food that you absolutely cannot stand? Liver. I hate liver and tongue. The reason I hate liver and tongue is that, um, like I said, we didn't grow up with a lot. Um, and so my parents would always buy like the cheap cuts of meat and things like that. So we had a lot of tongue growing up, which is just awful. I hate it. It's just, I don't like it. Um, yeah, so that. I'm not a big fan of liver and onions. I just don't like it. Um, um, let's see. Oh, here's another one. So this one is from Hidden Sight. Hidden in Sight? Okay. Um, did you enjoy working on Bionic Woman? I was so excited to see you. And after that BSG ended, then I was so blah, blah, beep, beep, pissed when it got canceled. Um, thank you so much. So the funny thing about Bionic Woman, um, if you guys didn't see Bionic Woman, it was a short lived series, I think on NBC, which would make sense because it was sci-fi. So um, I actually shot Bionic Woman and Battlestar Galactica at the same time on the same lot. They were in two stages right next to each other, which is part of the only reason why I was, I was able to do that. And also we shared the same producer and sci-fi, which is where Battlestar was and NBC, which is where Bionic Woman were, are both owned by Universal. See how that works? So that's why I was allowed to do both of them at the exact same time. Um, 
And so um, it actually got canceled before Battlestar got canceled, I think, or it was pretty concurrent. Um, I loved Sarah Corvus up until The Flash. Sarah Corvus was probably one of my favorite characters to play because she was a little crazy. Um, <clears throat> and then as soon as I got to play Amunet over at The Flash, um, she became my favorite character to play. Um, and that is because I literally get to play her. Um, Amunet is insane. And everything that I come up with to do seems to make it into the script and stuff because um, there's nothing that really doesn't work for her because she's so out of her mind. Um, so, um, Tyla Davis asks what your favorite movie is. Who did? Tyla Davis. Tyla Davis asks, what's my favorite movie? And why? So I have a lot of favorite movies. I know. So I'll give you my three favorite movies. Okay. Number one is High Noon. Y'all, if you haven't seen High Noon, go watch High Noon. It is one of the most amazing Westerns I've ever seen in my entire life. Um, I love it. It is phenomenal. It's such a good movie. The pacing is beautiful. Um, it, the fact that you, you know what's going to happen the entire time and they manage to keep you on pins and needles is just, it's such a... It's such a beautiful Western. So I would highly suggest going and watching High Noon. Um, the next one is Alien. Obviously, <laughs> I love Alien. Um, it was it was one of my favorite movies as a kid, um, which is slightly terrifying. Um, but I love Sigourney Weaver. I love everything about Sigourney Weaver. I love that she's managed to um, have a career with so many different types of characters in it. Um, when she has played such an iconic role in her in her early career toward the early part of her career. I loved it. I loved how this woman um, was seemingly so capable and strong and masculine. And at the same time, she was so feminine and soft um, and vulnerable. I just, I loved everything about that performance. I loved it. And, and she inspires me like constantly till this day. Um, and then the other one is the wedding planner with JLo and Matthew McConaughey. Guys, I watch this movie all the time. If this movie is on TV, I stop whatever I'm doing and I watch The Wedding Planner. Um, I think it's because I love JLo, but also because I think I would have been a really good wedding planner because I'm so crazy and so high energy and I love all things like pretty and vomity wedding stuff. I love it. Um, I love <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I'm obsessed. So those three movies, I would I would highly suggest. Jennifer Lesico asked about no carbs. Um, so Jennifer Lesico just said, "Do I mainly stick to no carbs besides ice cream cake? Um, inspiring workout videos, also energizing energizer bunny. You are okay. So here's the thing, guys, about carbohydrates. Um, if you're not interested in in fitness and nutrition, I'm sorry. I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a little ranty here for a second. Okay, I eat a ton of carbohydrates <laughs> all the time. Even when I'm at my leanest, I eat a ton of carbohydrates. Let me now clarify. I do not eat processed carbohydrates. I eat a lot of potatoes and um, starchy vegetables and um, carbs like that. If I'm going to eat a bread, I eat a gluten-free bread or something based in a gluten-free flour like uh, coconut flour or almond flour, but I limit those. Um, but I eat a lot of potatoes and rice um, and grains like that. It is, it is a big part of my diet. Um, oatmeal, things like that. Um, but this is the main thing. And this is one of the things that I have learned as I've gotten older, because I finally started taking nutrition seriously. When I first started to try and get like in better shape for Battlestar Galactica, um, I remember my 
my trainer at the time telling me to stop drinking. <laughs> and I laughed at him because I was like, <laughs> guy, I am 26 years old. I don't need to quit drinking. I've got metabolism on my side, blah, 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 blah. Um, yeah, no, you can't, you cannot be lean drinking. It's just not possible. I'm sorry. Um, you might be able to drink once a week or twice a week, whatever that number is for you. That's fine. But, but alcohol like typically and, and stereotypically and usually with people makes you retain water. So if you want to see muscles, you have to cut out things that bloat you. And alcohol is one of them. Processed foods are another one. And then another big one is sugar. So um, how I got in shape for another life was that I cut out all sugar, all gluten, um, all alcohol, and all dairy. And I know that sounds awful, you guys. And I know that that sounds like you're depriving yourself, but I ate a lot of food. I ate a lot of carbohydrates. I ate a lot of things that, that really filled me up. Um, but you can still get lean. There's no rules in my opinion about eating late or eating this or eating how many meals a day or those things. I think that there are ways to get leaner and sometimes you need to implement those more restrictive diets. If you, the more lean you want to get, but as far as just being in great shape and, and, and losing weight, alcohol and sugar and dairy, cutting those things out are we really, and processed carbs are really important. To clarify that you do no added sugar. You still eat fruit and stuff. Like oh, that. I still eat fruit. I eat a ton of fruit. Those people Natural that don't sugars. eat fruit, like freak me out. I never trusted a person who didn't eat fruit. Um, and as far as being the energizer bunny is concerned, you guys, I have a lot of energy. I have a lot of energy all the time. Um, uh, that being said, I, I wake up in the morning and I don't have a ton of energy, but, but I get going pretty fast. Six cups of coffee later. Six <laughs> cups of coffee. I drink a lot of coffee. That's not true. I've only had two cups of coffee today. Um, but yeah, so, um, I'm high on life y'all. Such a dick. Sorry. Um, okay. Uh, Chicken Whisper 1975 asked, how did you quit smoking? I'm trying and it's not going well. Okay. Honestly, you guys, quitting smoking is the hardest thing I've ever had to quit in my entire life. It's so hard. Um, I was such a good smoker. I smoked constantly. Um, and I smoked for a good 10 years, if not longer from like 18 to 34. Um, it's the hardest thing I've ever had to quit. That being said, um, and I tried constantly to quit smoking and it never worked. Um, I would quit for like a year or two months. And as soon as something stressful happened in my life, I would start smoking again. Um, so finally what I did was I actually got hypnotized. So, uh, believe it or not, um, it worked. Um, I, you can Google this man. He's amazing. His name is Carrie Gaynor and it's Carrie with a K. Um, I think it's like K E R R Y Gaynor, G A Y N O R Gaynor. He's actually got DVDs or something as well. I know that those could work as well. Um, but it, you have to be susceptible to hypnotizing. What I mean by that is that you have to be open to the idea. Now, when I was hypnotized, was I completely out? No, had someone screamed fire, I would have been able to get up and walk out. But the only thing that I can compare it to is um, it's like meditation, but someone else puts you into that place. So like when I meditate, um, it feels very similar to, to what um, hypnotism felt like to me. Um, so what it did for me was that I can be around someone who's smoking now. I can, um, some, sometimes I have people blow it in my face. I know it's not because I still, I love the smell of smoke, which is so strange, but I have zero desire to smoke because what, what it, what he does basically is he, he changes your perception of smoking. So remember that time in life when we all knew, and some of you adults still do, so I'm not talking to you, but like 
Um, maybe you have something else that you're addicted to in life, but remember, remember when we were younger and you knew smoking would kill you, you just knew it because you were told that it would. And it makes common sense. I mean, like, it's so bad for you. Like, of course it's going to not be good for your health. What it does. And then as a smoker, you start to go, Oh, not me. It's not going to happen to me. Blah, 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 blah. Right. What he does in the hypnotism is that he makes you know, without a shadow of a doubt, the next cigarette you smoke is going to kill you. And then you just don't smoke anymore. It's the craziest thing. I have zero desire to smoke. Zero whatsoever. I mean, like, it's just, it's the craziest thing. And I smoked two packs a day for 15 years and I have zero desire. So, um, and it's been eight, six years, six and a half years since I quit smoking. So, um, and I really have no desire and I've been in some of the most stressful situations of my life and I haven't smoked. So um, I would, I would um, suggest hypnotism. Um, you know, uh, I, I granted, I, <clears throat> I'm not a person who has those, an, another addiction that I needed to work on, but Carrie has said to me that his, his hypnotism can work for anyone with any kind of addiction. Um, you just have to be open to the idea. So, because in his philosophy, you shouldn't have to white knuckle something your entire life. You shouldn't have to see somebody smoking and go, God, just don't do it. Just don't do it. Just don't do it. Just don't do it. It's bad for me. You should just not want to. Um, so anyway, Carrie Gaynor, check it out. Um, which one am I looking at, baby? Nadira. Nadira. Hey, Nadira. What's up, girl? I don't see it. There she is. Um, how often do I meditate? Do I have any tips on how to clear your mind? I find that part difficult. So... Um, I actually took a transcendental meditation course. Now I know that TM has gotten a bad rap because it is $700. So I'm not going to lie to you. It's $700. Um, but it was a tax deductible. I don't quite know how that works. Um, you could Google it. I don't know. Um, but so I took a transcendental meditation course and the thing that I got out of TM, which was the most important thing to me is that you cannot fail at meditation, right? I think that when we think about meditation, we think you have to clear your mind. You shouldn't have any thoughts, blah, 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 blah. That's not what meditation is. You're going to have thoughts throughout your meditation. The difference is, is that you acknowledge those thoughts and you let them trickle away. You acknowledge them and then you let them go. So clearing your mind isn't what meditation is to me. What it is, is me sitting calmly in my own body, being present and breathing, and I have a mantra that I say, and my mantra is repetitive, and I say it for the entire time. Now, there are moments when I forget, or, or all of a sudden I'm thinking about dinner, and then you just, you don't get mad, you don't panic, you just go, oh, I'm thinking about dinner. Back to my mantra, back to my mantra. And so meditation has been really great for me. I know there are a lot of really great apps out there as well. Um, I also know that Callum Keith Rennie taught himself how to do TM online. So I know that if you don't want to take the course, I wouldn't suggest this just because I know that the course was so great for me and learning how to do TM from somebody that actually knew what they were doing was so great. Um, there are also, um, there's another form of meditation that Cassidy Freeman does. Um, will you look that up, baby? It's um, Cassidy does Ayurvedic meditation. Ayurvedic, yeah. No, it's not Ayurvedic. It's um, something else. It's um, uh, um, somebody who had learned the principle of transcendental meditation moved away and started their own form of um, meditation. And so there's a different word for it that they use. Um, and so if that whole idea of TM scares you, there's, uh, Robin's looking for it. Um, <clears throat> here's this one from Scott. Hey, Katie, loved you in BSG. Top five best shows ever. Thank you. 
love the soundtrack as well. Okay. My question is, why did you decide to get a pug? I'm on my second one and I love my little gremlin. Um, so I didn't actually decide to get a pug. All of my dogs have found me. Um, <clears throat> Nellie Bean um, is, <laughs> she's, she's just a monkey. She's such a little monkey. So I went to go, the story of Nellie Bean is that I went to go uh, waste some time um, I was early for an appointment and I went to go uh, look at some dogs and stuff and, and hang out and just like play with some. And um, Nellie Bean was sitting all by herself, um, sort of like in the corner. And I was so sad for her because she was like this, this little munchkin. And I picked her up and I shit you not, she was sitting on a picture of my face. Um, they were using old newspaper as like pee pee pads in, in the kennels. And um, she was sitting on my face. So that is how she got the name Nellie B because the picture was of Nell Bickford. Um, so yeah. Vedic meditation? Oh yeah, the, uh, it's called Vedic meditation and it's just V-E-D-I-C. Um, and I think that it, um, pretty much it's idea. pretty much the same idea as TM, but um, people have called it less culty. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, um, so um, let's see. Um, what would be a piece of advice you would offer to someone going through their mid twenties from Shelly? Oh my gosh, Shelly. Um, mid twenties. I would say that you are so young um, and not in a condescending way, like not in a like, oh, you're a baby, but like in you're so young in that you've got so much life left, so many possibilities. You know, I think that I think that times have changed. You know, when when my parents were kids, you picked a career, you got married and you stuck with both of them. Right. Um, and I think um, and you had your kids and you did that whole thing. Very stereotypical sort of. Uh, uh, way of uh, living your life. Reinvention now is something that is so celebrated and it's so important. And I think sometimes when we're younger or in when we're older, we get caught up in what we thought we were supposed to do and what we're, we thought we were supposed to be. And I think that one of the things that I would tell somebody in their mid twenties is that Whatever you want to do, wherever your heart takes you, you should follow that because you're so young and reinventing yourself is so, you should be able to do it a lot. We should be able to do that a lot. Now, what I'm saying, it, it, a lot of people say that, you know, you can't always follow your dreams because, you know, you have to get a real job or, and you have to support yourself and, and you can't start all over again. I absolutely understand what it looks like to stick with something because of finances. My mom was a teacher. She made with a, a master's degree, made $30,000 a year. She taught for 30 years, 34 years, and she supported our entire family with that money um, until my dad started building more houses. So had my mom decided to reinvent herself we would have been up shit Creek. So I do understand that. And, and I am, we are so blessed that my mother stayed that course because it provided us with the stability for my father to follow his dream and to do what he wanted to do. Um, so like I said, times have changed. And I think now, um, you know, I see my mom now at 73 doing things that she always wanted to do, like raising bees and having that, that fun and, and experiencing that. So I would just say it in your mid twenties to, to constantly allow yourself to change and constantly allow yourself to be wrong. You know, you're allowed to be wrong. You're allowed to change. Just, you don't know who you're going to be until the end of your life. You know, that's what we get with hindsight. So just keep going and keep reinventing yourself. If, if you make a mistake and you decide, oh, I didn't really like that, try something different. Like, try something different. Um, I would just try as much as possible. 
Speaking of bees and your mom, they should go watch. Oh, yeah. Robin's saying, speaking of bees and my mom, you should go watch the bee episode that we shot because I'm actually allergic to bees. My mom got a little bit of shit over that, by the way, because everyone was like, you're sending your daughter to her death. <laughs> so, it was kind of funny. But so um, I have. So the story of me with bees was that when I was eight years old, my brother was building a fort and we grew up in a very small town and we were constantly playing out in the woods and getting into trouble and stuff. And my brother got mad at me and he wouldn't let me go build a fort with him. And I was so upset. So I went to the garage and I filled a cardboard box with nails and hammers and wood. And I was dragging the box through the woods and I was going to build my own damn fort. And I was pulling it and I felt stinging nettles which happens, whatever. We lived in the country, it's stinging nettles. And then all of a sudden I looked down and I was covered in wasps, mud wasps. I'd stepped on a nest and they were crawling up my legs. And I remember just like freaking the F out. I had on cute little spandex biker shorts that had like a fluorescent pink little stripe up the side because it was the 80s and like fluorescent pink was big. Anyway, so... I'm running across the grass and screaming and crying. And my mom strips my clothes off me, sprays me with a hose, didn't take me to the hospital because why would you do that? And threw me in a bathtub with baking soda um, and, and ice. Um, and that's what they did. And I was fine. And they gave me a Benadryl and everything was fine. Um, the next time I got stung was about 12 years old, 13 years old. Um, a bee flew into my soccer shorts and stung my bum it swelled up really bad. I didn't go to the emergency room again. It just swelled up really bad. Then I got stung in my twenties and I had to go to the hospital. Um, they didn't give me an EpiPen, but I was definitely admitted into the hospital and they gave me a bunch of medicine and I was better. Maybe they did give me something for it. I don't really remember, but they prescribed an EpiPen and I had an EpiPen for the rest of my life. I still carry it with me. Um, I have never had to use my EpiPen. So I didn't get stung again for 25 years. 20, no. So I got stung at 21, like 15 years. Um, and the next time I got stung was right here. I actually posted about it on my Instagram and, um, I got stung and I remember I was on a run and it got stuck in my sports bra and I remember stopping and I asked these people cause I didn't want to look and I was so far away from home. I didn't know what to do. And I was like, um, I know this is going to sound stupid, but how bad does this look? And they were like, uh, it's really swollen. You should probably, you know, you should just go put some ice on it. And I was like, okay. And it had just happened like seconds before. So I ran home, grabbed my EpiPen, called my mom and I drove to the ER, which was, I was probably home and in my car and to the ER within seven minutes. And I let them know that I was there. I had my EpiPen, but I didn't want to use it. And so I sat in the waiting room and told the lady that I was there and I sat there and I waited to see if I would need to use it. And it was so swollen, um, but I didn't have to use my EpiPen. So while I am allergic to bees, I'm not, um, I didn't go into anaphylactic shock the last time I get stung. The doctors think that you, you build up a tolerance again when you get the histamine out of your system. Cause my little body was like, overrun with it. So anyway, there you go. Um, so elder Ben says, do you watch your own shows? I do I'm not one of those people that's like, no, I can't stand to watch myself. Uh, <laughs> um, I watch it one time. Um, and largely I do it to critique myself. Um, and then I do it as well because I want to be able to talk to you guys or to do interviews about the role and about um, sort of like uh, the perception, you know, how you guys like the character and things like that. And so the, the, the reason that I do that is um, so I watch everything one time and then I don't really watch it again. So um, 
Hi, I'm 46. Just found my career path with journalism last year. Never knew I had the chops to write. Supreme heretic. That's awesome. See, that's great. So you're 46 and you just dis- like just found your path of writing. So awesome. That is the lesson to the person who is in their mid-20s and to everyone else. It's never too late to find the thing that fills your heart with joy. Um, so yeah, anyway. Um um what is the next one um what have you learned from your mom over the years what have i learned from my mom over the years any paradise um everything you know i think that we learn everything from our parents um i don't know i think so um you know i i learned my mom is the most giving um, selfless, like caring human being I've ever met. Um, so I've learned all of those things from my mom. What I've also learned from my mom is how detrimental being that type of person can be to your own personal health and well being. Um, if you're constantly worried about other people and not yourself, um, sometimes you can let your own, um, desires and health and joy and things fade because you live for other people. Um, And so I have learned that to take those good things from my mom, but I think that I've also learned by watching her silently suffer sometimes um, how to find a happy medium. So um, next question, Um, Molly Mander, how do you find motivation to stay in shape other than having two for your roles? Okay. So I love being active. I've always been physically active. I've always been that weird person that took the stairs instead of the elevator just because like, why not? (laughs) So I've always been one of those people. Um, So one of the greatest motivators I've had in my life is obviously my career. So um, that has been a really big motivator for me to stay in shape. That being said, when I started doing it for myself about two years ago, like really started doing it for myself, and I found something outside of my career that motivated me, like uh, the Spartan race, or um, I wanted to see if I could run better, so I took a running course, um, and you know those types of things. It, it it became easier to find my motivation because it, it was for myself now instead of for outside influences. Um, so what I did, and this is one of the reasons why you guys are here, sort of, maybe. I mean, you might be here just because of like my work as well. But the reason I started putting out those exercise videos on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays is because I needed motivation to work out at home. <laughs> One of the hardest things to do, so I am with y'all, is sitting inside in self-isolation, trying to eat healthy, trying not to drink a bottle of scotch a day, and trying to exercise. It is so hard. So that is why I started recording those videos, not only for you guys, because I thought, hey, this could be kind of fun if people actually... They, they, they always ask me what it's like to what I do working out. I wanted to allow you guys to potentially be able to work out with me and see that like I struggle, like I have fun, like let's mix up workouts, things like that. But also, um, I needed to motivate myself. I needed to be, um, um, like, I guess culpable to show up and give you guys something that I said I was going to do. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, which has been better for me because it's actually kept me working out in isolation because there are days when all I want to do, you guys, like I'm I'm not kidding, is eat chips, drink scotch or Sauvignon Blanc and watch the Great Canadian Baking Show or the Great British Bake Off. They're my two favorite shows. They're guilty pleasures. I love them. Um... So that's what I want to do. So um, this is a weird time for all of us. And so I think that there's a little bit of 
you got to allow yourself to sit at home and sort of go, I'm going to watch TV today. Let's do this. I'm going to eat chips today. But if we marry that with a little bit of activity, then we don't have to come out of this self or this isolation, um, you know, um, with, with, um, you know, potentially um, um, some of those ramifications that can happen um, for myself. I know that I have the tendency to get a little depressed um, when I sit at home and, and I don't get physically active. So I know that if I sat home for however long this quarantine is going to be, and I wasn't physically fit, and I drank too much, and I ate um, the way that I'm sort of, you know, <laughs> an easy way to dive into those bag of chips would be, um, I could come out of this a, a shell of myself, um, suffering from depression. And I, I don't want to do that. So I need to fight that. Um, and that's why I've been doing the workout. So um, um, so what kind of motivation can you give to someone who's having a mentally rough time during this crazy, you need it badly? Um, I, uh, um, thank you, Tamara. I, I think that that's one of the things that I just touched on is that this is really strange for all of us. I think, um, there are a lot of people that still have to go to work and thank you so much to those people. I think we've realized who the real heroes are in our society right now. Um, they are the 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 first responders, the doctors, um, the the police officers, the 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 grocery store clerks, the everyone that's going the 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 transit, the, drivers. The transit drivers, the 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 people that are working our produce. Um, the people that are working and, and picking the produce and getting the produce out there. So we still have fresh produce every day. Those people are such heroes right now because the rest of us have learned that our jobs, the world can move on without my job. <laughs> so um, I, I thank you so much to those people. And I know that it's hard to stay motivated and I know that it's scary to, to not know what it's going to look like. I think that that we're all scared of this. We all have no idea what it's going to look like. We don't know potentially where our next paycheck is coming from or when it's going to come and if the government assistance is going to be enough and what's going to happen with our housing and, and what's going to happen with our health and what's going to happen with the people that we love. There are so many questions. And so we have to stay focused on the things that we have control over right now. Um, and for me, that is um, staying physically active, um, trying to meditate, trying to connect with the people that I love and avoiding too much of the news and really just trying to keep my mental health at a place that's positive and also pivoting. You know, um, I think that there are a lot of people that are learning that, that maybe um, the career that they wanted or the career that they've been following um, might need to shift and might need to pivot. Um, it, it's going to be a very interesting society that we come out into. So I think we're all going to have to just support each other. Um, um, do you have another one? Uh, Sarah Spence. Sarah Spence, how do you come to terms with things about yourself that you have no control over, but you really hate? I have a condition that affects my hair growth. It's hereditary and curable. It makes me feel so ugly. Sarah, girl, um, that breaks my heart. I, I'm, um, I'm, I'm sorry that, that you um, are dealing with what you're dealing with. Um, you know, there are things about ourselves that sometimes we don't like and we wish that we could change. Um, and if it is something outside of your control, if it's something that is a, a, a mental, con a, 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 a medical condition that, that you don't have control over um, and you have to learn to accept that, um, you know, I, I think that, that's, it's easier said than done, right? Um, I think that um, age helps a lot with some of the things that for myself, because I can only speak about myself, right? Um, age helps a lot with those things because I think that the older you get, the more you realize how lucky you are and how blessed you are to have the things that you have. Um, 
you know, I, I read this great, this great quote one time. Um, and then my dad and I have talked about it as well since then. And my dad said that if you took the world's shit and everybody put shit in a, in a, in a bucket and the, you know, stirred it all up and you could take anything back out that you wanted. And it had to be these bad things. It couldn't be positive stuff. It had to be bad stuff. You would take back out the stuff that was already yours because you've, you know how to handle it. You've already, you know, you've already built up the ability to handle that stuff. Um, and so I, I, I remember that kind of stuff. I, I try to hold on to that kind of stuff. Um, when I, when I got sick and had cancer in 2008, um, the two years after that were really hard for myself because I, um, I felt like a shell of myself. I didn't have energy. I was tired. Um, I gained some weight. Um, I was depressed all the time. Um, I, my relationship was falling apart. Um, because of a lot of that stuff. Um, and because it's really hard for a partner to see somebody go through pain and they can't fix it. Um, all of those things. And I felt really sorry for myself. And I was going to therapy at the time. And the therapist said to me, you have a very beautiful excuse right now for all of the things in your life that are going wrong. Um, and if you continue to blame that, you will continue to have these problems in your life. And she made me understand that I had to take responsibility for the things in my life that were going wrong, um, that I had control over, um, because it was spiraling me out of control and I was blaming everything on my thyroid cancer. Um, and so that's when I started taking responsibility and pushing forward um, and realizing that we all have hardships. We all have things. Nobody knows what it's like to be in another person's shoes. Um, we always think the grass is greener, but we have to take responsibility for our own stuff and push through it. If you know something is going to be a part of you for the rest of your life, you have to learn how to love and accept that part of you because it is you. It is uniquely you and there's nobody like you in the world. So that makes you already special. And knowing that, just keep going forward um, and, 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 and find a way to, to truly turn those hardships into lessons for yourself and other people. And, and so that's sort of what I tried to do. Um, and I, I, Sarah, I think that therapy is a beautiful thing. So I would highly suggest finding someone that you can talk to um, um, who is a professional and can help you with the unique set of things that you're dealing with. So that's really important as well. Um, what is my favorite getaway spot in Oregon? <clears throat> um, this is simple, you guys. Um, my favorite place to get away in Oregon is Mount Hood. Um, I love Mount Hood. Um, I'm obsessed with Mount Hood. I want to live in Mount Hood. <laughs> um, I love it. I think it's um, uh, fantastic. It's my favorite place. It's the mountains. It smells good. It just makes me happy. Um, um, our next YouTube episode actually films there. So that episode that comes out soon um, is there. And I think you'll see why. It's just gorgeous. Um, uh, you haven't been to Oregon, you should go to Oregon, but all the people from Oregon would say, please come and visit, but then go home. <laughs> so don't move there. <laughs> then everyone from Oregon will be mad at me. Bottom, um, bottom one. So, uh, this is from Chilagina. Um, was Robin a big BSG fan before he met you? Um, Robin's never seen anything I've done. He didn't even know who you were. He didn't know who I was. Nothing. You never saw anything? No, I had no idea who you were. Robin's also 10 years younger than me. So when I was on Battlestar <laughs> Galactica, he was 12. So there is that. 
<laughs> Listen, this is this is the funny thing about dating somebody that's younger than me is that like so many old dudes date young women. Like, and it's so socially acceptable. We're like, that's awesome. Like, he's just found somebody that keeps up with him. That's great. Yay. Um, a woman does it, and for some reason, it's like this crazy, like social experiment. Like, I don't even understand. <laughs> It's so funny. I think it's hysterical. <laughs> um, Someone asked earlier what your favorite guest star was. My favorite guest star? Yeah. Oh, that I've done? Mm -hmm. uh, it's The Flash. Okay. Yeah. Well, no, that's, I mean, listen, you guys, I've done so many fun. Like, I loved being on The Big Bang Theory. I loved playing myself. Um, I thought it was absolutely hysterical. Um, I did an episode on ER when I was a kid. And I got to work with Don Cheadle and it was just like amazing. Um, I did um, I did a guest star on Law and Order at one point and I got to work with um, um, Jeremy Sisto and Anthony Anderson and I absolutely adore both of them. So like that was, uh, that was just so cool. Um, and then like, oh my God, workaholics. Are you kidding? Like who doesn't want to play like some drug addicted homeless prostitute it's like a dream come true <laughs> um okay so um how did you teach yourself to, oh this is the same one. Oh, sorry um i'm late to the game but i asked you a question last night on instagram regarding reflecting on things in our past bringing is to where we are now um cora oh uh, yeah i remember this question cora i think i remember this question it was about um um, reflecting on the things in my past that have brought me to now. And I thought of all of the things in our life that, um, you know, I found myself sort of reflecting on this just this last week when I got engaged. Um, and I think, <clears throat> um, reflecting on our past is such an important thing. Um, and sometimes when we're in the midst of, heartache or betrayal or um, a loss or um, um, a struggle of some sort, all of those things in our life that we try, we, we constantly ask, why me? Why this? Why now? I mean, I cannot tell you how many times I have cried and just like, you know, cried to God and been like, why is this happening to me? Um, you do not really understand why things happen to you or what something's purpose was until you have the benefit of hindsight. Um, and I think that um, so much of the things that, that just purely in speaking relationships here, so many of the things that I've gone through in relationships and the decisions that I've made in relationships, um, that didn't make sense or that didn't quite understand um, became so crystal clear um, when I met Robin and found Robin and um, it just made complete sense. Like it just, all of those things made sense. So, um, so I guess I've looked back on a lot of the decisions that I made something as simple as, you know, when I chose to do Battlestar Galactica instead of NCIS, um, I chose to go right instead of left. You have to go back and go, wow, I wonder what, you know, life would have looked like if I'd done that instead of this. Um, so many of those things, you know, when I was 16 years old, I was a swimmer. Um, you know, my plan was to, I would have loved to have swum in the Olympics. I don't know if that was an actual option or not, but, um, that was my goal. My, my goal was to swim at Stanford. Um, I wanted to be a swimmer. I had, that was my career plan. And, um, and I was also thinking of something either in journalism or marine biology. Like I was trying to find something, a career that had something to do with my interests. I've always been very interested in, in the oceans. And, um, and I was also very interested in, in, um, travel and, and journalism. Um, but I got hurt. Um, 
at 16, I dislocated my knees and I had to stop swimming and I had to sort of pivot and reinvent myself and decide what I wanted to do at that point. And so I became an actor. My mom quite literally scraped me off the floor and handed me a paper or a piece of paper that was in um, the newspaper, an ad in the newspaper looking for a body double for Kirsten Dunst. And she did it just to get me out of the house because I was so depressed about the state that I found myself in, you know, I, I lost friends, I'd lost a potential scholarship to college, I'd lost what I thought my career was going to be, I lost all of these things. And I didn't know what to do. And my mom took me down to be a body double for Kirsten Dunst. And I went in and, and um, they said, I'm sorry, you're, you're too tall. And I probably, you know, outweighed her by 15 pounds at that point. Um, and um, they said, but can you act? And being the crazy child that I was, I just went, of course I can act, of course I can. Um, and they gave me the, the papers and the sides to come back the next day and audition to, to have a role in the movie. Um, I went home that night and I memorized the entire huge monologue for this movie called 15 and Pregnant. It was a lifetime movie. Um, my mom helped me and I went back the next day and I got the role. Getting that role gave me my career because it introduced me to the director who convinced my mother that I had something special and she flew me down to LA and that director introduced me to my manager who is still my manager today. Um, and getting the role in that movie, it was two scenes in this, this tiny lifetime movie and it taft hartley me into the union, which means that they paid a fee to get me into the union because they were hiring someone that was out of the union. Those, that one thing changed the course of my life and it wouldn't have happened had I not dislocated my knees. So we, we have to sort of um, understand that the things that are, that are facing us right now are all there for a reason. And we just, we just don't know what that reason is yet until we have the benefit of hindsight. So Mathilde asked, have you ever been to France? Have I ever been to France? Mathilde asked that. Mathilde. Mathilde. Yes, I've been to France. I love France. I love Paris. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> um, so when I uh, was, when my dog Meatball passed away, actually, um, August 27th, 2014, um, I took a convention in Europe to get out of town. And I went with my, one of my best girlfriends, Charm. And I made a bunch of money at the convention. And we decided, I, I looked at her about three days in and went, I don't want to go home yet. So we spent all the money I made and we stayed in Paris for 10 days. And it was one of the best trips of my life. Um, and it was just, it was, it was a really interesting thing because I had never done anything like that in my life. I had never said, I'm just not going to come back. Um, but I, I just sort of listened to myself and <clears throat> um, knew that it was something that I needed to do. And I love Paris. I want to go back. Um, I want to go back with this guy because he's never been to Paris. Um, so we'll have to go back. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to stay on for, 10 more minutes or so, and then I'm going to, I'm going to get off. But, um, so comedy taste, Mel Brooks and Monty Python, Mel Brooks, Mel Brooks. I mean, I love Monty Python. Um, you're more Monty Python. I am more Monty. Yeah, definitely. He's more Monty Python. What was that thing that happened to us the other day where you said something and I was like, what's that from? And it was Monty Python. Oh, I don't know. I don't remember what it was. The Holy um, Grail. Maybe. It was some quote of some sort that you maybe it was like in a conversation with like a friend or I don't remember what it was. Um, um, uh, do I think that I'll do a convention this year once the coronavirus um, or the COVID blows over? I, probably. You know, I, I have some conventions. Um, I know that somebody had asked about Longmire Days. I've got some conventions planned. That being said, uh, we have no idea when this is going to be over and we have no idea when they're going to actually allow um, big groups of people to start to congregate again. So 
Um, as soon as it is safe to do so, I would love to do a convention again. Um, hopefully, um, hopefully we, we, we get a handle on this shortly. So stay home, self-isolate if you're not doing that. George, happy birthday. Um, George, happy birthday. George Peter Gatsis. Happy birthday. Um, so here's another one. Are you still riding motorcycles? What are your favorite bikes to ride? Um, from Dominic Martino. Um, I do still ride motorbikes. Um, however, my motorcycles are in Los Angeles and I am in Canada. Um, a lot of people have asked me why I'm in Canada. A um, couple reasons. Number one, we were a month into filming the second season of Another Life um, when all of this happened. Uh, most of the cast chose to go home. Um, three of us chose to stay here. Myself, Justin Chatwin, um, and Samuel Anderson are all still here. Um, and um, we stayed, I stayed for a couple reasons. One, um, this guy over here that's like dancing around like a fucking lunatic. Um, I stayed because of him um, because I had a work permit to be in Canada and he did not, um, they weren't allowing non-residents to come into the United States at that time. So that was one of the reasons we stayed here. We already had the rental house up here. So um, it just made sense. The dogs were already up here. It just made sense to write it out here instead of Los Angeles when it was also safer to be up in Canada than it was to be in Los Angeles. So that was one of the main things. And um, we're thinking about actually renting motorbikes next weekend and going for a ride if it's safe to do so, because um, it's actually, um, uh, it's, it's still self-isolating. I mean, you're, you're on a motorcycle in a helmet and it's not like we would go anywhere. So I don't know, maybe we'll do that just to get out or something if it's an option. I don't really know if that's an option or if it's smart, we'll figure it out. Um, Kitten McCreary Navis, what is the first thing you're going to do when quarantine rules are no longer in play? I am going to go hug my family. Aww. Yeah. Um, that's the thing that, that has scared me the most out of all of this is that my mom and dad and sister have been working through this entire thing. Um, they manage um, a bunch of apartments. And so they've gone to work every single day to make sure that those apartments are clean and that people have a safe place to stay home. Um, and um, my dad is a he's in construction and construction has been deemed essential as well. Um, <clears throat> I was explaining this to someone the other day <clears throat> because our home in Los Angeles is still under construction. <clears throat> and they were a little frustrated by that, that people were still going to work in construction. Here's my feeling about that. Um, one of the th main things is that it's keeping people working, which is really great for a lot of people. Um, there are self-isolation rules set in place in California. You're only allowed to have one sub there at a time and you, everyone has to be like 12 feet apart. They have to wear face masks. So right now our sheet rockers are there. There are four people in this entire house. They're all in different rooms and they've all got masks on. Um, and the other one is that our home was open. So, um, and this is a thing that with my dad building in Oregon is that the homes are open. Um, it's raining in California. It's raining in Oregon. You can't just leave a house with no roof on it. Um, it would just, the, the, it would be destroyed. Um, and so that is one of the things that our home is open. And, and when it gets to a point where we can close it up, then we'll make the decision if it's safe at that point to do so um, and whether or not to pick up construction when it's all over or to keep moving at the pace that we've been uh, legally allowed to, which is one sub at a time. Um, so uh, we shall figure that out. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Paige so, Ron wants to know, what are you most looking forward to about being married? <laughs> what are you most looking forward to about being married? Can't I'm looking, just... I'm looking forward to you shaving. No, that's not going to happen. You guys, this is Robin. Hey, everybody. So Robin normally um, doesn't have this, but he's decided that this is his quarantine beard. It's majestic. <laughs> It is majestic. Yeah. You look like a like a sexy lumberjack. What am I looking forward to though? Yeah. Just can't okay. wait to be like, that's my wife. Get yeah. your hands off my wife. 
<laughs> you don't mess with my wife. Yeah, just yeah. repeatedly. I'm just gonna yell about. I'm just gonna yell about her being my wife a lot. <laughs> That's all I want to do. That's all yeah. I've ever dreamed That's about. That's it. That's all you want to do. Yeah. Turn the camera around. <laughs> <laughs> um, what am I most looking forward to about being married? Um, it's my best friend. He's my best friend. This weird guy. That's what I. That's what. That's what I was just gonna say. Yeah, that. <laughs> She's my best friend. Yeah, I just. Um, I don't know. You know, I've. I've. Um, I've sort of. I've. Uh, you. You. You encounter different people in your lives, and and everybody serves a purpose. I think, and you know, um, I. Um, I'm so glad that none of those relationships worked out because I, I honestly like have never been with someone that, um, that just gets me like, there's no trepidation. There's no like insecurity. There's none of that. There's just, you wake up in the morning and you know that this person's going to love you even if you have a bad day. And like, it's just awesome. It's probably a good place to to end this. To end? Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start talking about our sex. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm, just kidding. I'm just kidding. Your mom's probably on here. <laughs> um. So anyway, um. yeah, I'm excited. I don't know. I don't know if you're allowed to wear white at 40. Are you allowed to wear white? Why would you be allowed to wear white? Because that ship sailed. No. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I've never wanted to have like a wedding, you know, like, um, I think that, that, um, maybe this might be hard for people to believe, but that I, I actually don't like attention being on me, um, in person. I think that, um, there's 116 people here right now. If you were all in my house staring at me, I think I would have a panic attack and go hide in the bathroom. Um, and so I've never wanted to have people staring at me for a wedding. Um, and I've realized now that I've gotten older that none of that matters. Um, you know, all that that matters that comes out of it is that that I have a partner to go through life with and experience the ups and the downs and to go on all these adventures with. And, you know, um, as long as there's ice cream cake, I don't really care. <laughs> So, um, all right. So thank you guys so much for being here. That was an hour and a half of the Q and a, um, thank you guys. You made it go so fast. I really, really appreciate it. Um, and, uh, look out for a new fitness video tomorrow. It is legs. Um, it is going to be a doozy. This is what we're doing today for legs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine exercises. So I'm going to do that exercise today and I'm going to put it up tomorrow. Um, and then the, another one will come out Friday. And then uh, our episode, How to Make the Perfect Latte, will come out this weekend. I promise I will make sure you guys have an alert of that. But if you haven't subscribed to the channel and you're just here for fun, um, make sure you subscribe. Make sure you set the little alert bell, the little dingy ding thing thing. Um, and make sure you thumbs up. Um, and then, um, then you'll get alerts because then your computer will tell you when I post new stuff. So, um, yeah. Okay. Um, have an amazing week. Thank you all for joining me. Thank you for um, not only supporting me, but supporting each other through all of this. I know that this is really just an unprecedented time and there is so much um, um, sort of like, you know, anxiety and fear and frustration and anger. And, um, you know, um, the most important thing that we can do is make sure that we don't um, point all of those things out to other people, make sure that that we really sort of um, hold on to those things and, and try to keep a good balance um, and not start blaming the world for this. Um, I, um, I love you all. Thank you so much for being here. Stay home, stay safe um, stay healthy. Um, and, um, I will see you guys later. Bye. <laughs>